one of our favorite people who comes back to us just about every year. It's almost, I think it's a decade now. I think it's 10 years since he first started joining us. And he always tells us things about women and women's rights and religions and how women have been misused. And he's a very dynamic speaker, very creative. And his wife, Yolanda, is a treasure, just a treasure, and a good friend of the event, too. And they both run after school programs that make a huge difference in the city. They're, they run it together. I didn't mean that to sound like they had separate ones. They run it together. They run a program teaching children to play chess. And it is really awesome. And so without further ado, I wish to introduce our great friend, a great friend of freedom of expression, and a great friend of the imagination, our very own local author, Warren Woodbury, who's going to be talking to us about critical thinking on women's history or the history of women's. Take it away, Warren, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Paulette. You read the compliments just like I wrote them. Okay. On the 24th year of the UT Coalition on Banned Book Week, September 30th, uh, and really a pleasure to be here again. I would like to build on Renee's presentation on critical thinking. My name is Warren Woodbury. I'm from Holy Toledo. And what better place to be from to discuss religion than Holy Toledo. My topic is critical thinking about the history of the war on women. Today we celebrate Banned Books Week, but we obviously will need to have a day to celebrate permission to use our great God-given brain and be able to think critically on any subject in the future. Detectives, lawyers, prosecutors, intelligence agencies, fire department, insurance company, among other groups of investigators, practice and are well advised to gather relevant evidence systematically and to postpone even a minute opinion of an explanatory hypothesis until the collected evidence rules out with the appropriate degree of certainty all but one logical explanation. So some in opposite corners of the subject on critical thinking are for and against allowing it to be taught in schools. Of course, I believe that what affects the position of both sides is the second word that comes after critical. For example, critical race, critical history, critical religion, critical opinion on women. They will all receive a strong challenge. Common sense to me says also that there's obviously a view by the mistreaters that differs from the view of the mistreated. And if the mistreater has the power of the media, the money and the narrative and the law to only have his or her version of what happened to people, how is critical thinking to survive on any subject, whether in science, math, worldviews or pandemics? Back in the day, it was against the law to deny that the world was flat or that the earth revolved around the sun. And poor Galileo was constantly threatened with penalties of imprisonment and death for his beliefs which at the time went against the power of the Catholic Church. His life was spared because he denounced his true beliefs under extreme pressure from the church about astronomy and other issues. And in the deal he made with the Catholic Church to spare him. Many others in many other religions were threatened and some eventually put to death for having an opinion that differed from various religions or the high and the mighty. Critical thinking about the Holocaust and common sense is constantly used today against Holocaust deniers, and rightfully so, in my personal opinion. My concern is the critical thinking about the treatment of women sanctioned falsely in most cases as a directive from God cannot possibly be left to stand. According to the many misogynistic, hateful, and derogatory accusations made against women, critical thinking of the treatment of women is not just needed, but is demanded. John Stuart Mill, Thoughts on Free Speech on Liberty, and I quote, he who knows only his side of the case knows little of that. His reasons may be good and no one may be able to refute them, but if 
But if he is equally unable to refute the reasons on the opposite side, if he does not so much as know what they are, he has no ground for preferring either opinion. In evaluating the history of what I declare is one of the longest standing wars in the history of the world is the war on women. This is a quoted joke, probably on the bucket list of many women. A woman comes home screeching her car tires as she pulls into the driveway and runs into the house. She slammed the door and shouted excitedly, honey, pack your bags, I won the lottery. The husband said, oh my God, what should I pack? Beach stuff or mountain stuff? Doesn't matter, she said, just get the hell out. This is quoted joke number two that lives in the hearts of men in the past, present, and will be there in the future. In the beginning of time, God created the world and then rested. Then God created man and rested. Then God created woman. Since then, neither God nor man has rested. But if you're not afraid of the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, most of my narrative will reign true. It will make a man eating in bed throw his french fries and burgers out of his golden palace window. So sit back, stay off of Twitter, and get a view of the longest running war in the history of the world, a history of the war on women that you will never find in your military studies on war in any school from West Point to Annapolis. Many religions are based on the indictment, indictment of women. And of course, they do not want any critical thinking on that or many other subjects. One far right woman, let's call her Karen, obviously took her privileges to say what she wanted to say, but she told a star basketball player, just shut up and dribble, as if he had no right to discuss his concern for his people. Various wars are taught in military schools and colleges throughout the nation. The when, where, how, who, and other questions and opinions about the art outcome are all over the place. Critical thinking is a go-to folder to analyze a war and its cause and effects. Sometimes they get as close to the truth as possible, while at other times, based on the bias of the historian, they miss the true story intentionally or unintentionally. Critical thinking to the rescue, or just ban it like they did books and science in the past. But what is the logic behind not using critical thinking to think about the misogynistic and cruel treatment imposed on women all over the world? In a war, bombs dropped indiscriminately cannot tell the difference between an army uniform and a woman in a burqa. Bombs cannot tell the difference between a backyard garden or a military base. These bombs and drones cannot tell the difference between a, a AK-47 strapped on the back of a soldier or a woman with a child strapped on her back. Collateral damage of women is never a topic in a military school. Why isn't war on women a subject discussed at least in college students? It is publicly noted some do not want to discuss critical race theory as it might offend the young and give them a guilt conflict for the sins of their father. But some make the argument that where was the concern for the sensitivities of the young mind during slavery when children of the power class were brought to hangings, burnings, the tarring of slaves, and a gruesome collection of body parts as souvenirs. You can't make this stuff up. Go to your pictorial books on the audiences for these brutalities as whole families with children stood hand in hand while watching human beings being murdered, tarred and feathered, and tortured. But it is said by some that those in the power that wrote his story would not tolerate dissent for fear of exposing the sins of their great grandfather to their great grandchildren, concern for their children, but not for concern for the children of the victims. I'll leave the teaching of critical thinking and teaching in schools to those best prepared for the battle. My podcast will be taken from my book, For We Are Strangers, which gives, shows the tortured relationship between religions and women. My podcast will be called Girls Not Out at the Mall. And I look forward to welcoming you to my upcoming, upcoming podcast on the subject about the war on women that has raised from the beginning of human existence on this planet. I will use critical thinking to critically examine the war on women by religions throughout the world. From the beginning, man has attempted to, and in many cases succeeded in editing many religious, religious texts in order to challenge the concept that God, any God, created woman as an equal to man and to promote the theory that God agreed that women were evil and in the downfall of man. It is recorded that women were the curse of man, which is often quite found in various man-made major religious texts. 
Anger is directed at the Christian God for creating the unwanted creature called woman. While in Greek mythology, the god Zeus created Pandora as the first woman on earth to specifically and with malice entice and destroy men. This myth from Greek mythology appears to be the basis that some of the religions made their cornerstone belief about women. But I believe that God decided that since men voiced their opinion that this creation of woman was a big mistake and women should not have been created because they brought evil into the world, God decided to stack the world with about 3.7 billion more women, almost 49% of the world's population. Take that, you questioners of the wisdom of God. But in my podcast, God calls four characters from the historical religious section to the largest mall in Toledo, Ohio, because God is sick of this twisting of his intention about the relationship between men and women. The biblical Adam and Eve and the mytholo mythological Pandora and the Torah mentioned Lilith argues about the history of the war on women by many religions. Early church writers and today even misogynistic men of immense power, influence and in politics in America, in the other, in other parts of the world, and the war on women continues. Here's some conversation held between the characters in my podcast. Pandora, I can't believe any religious book inspired by God would have said these words to describe a woman which was created by the hands of God. This is proof that the words we hear and read from religious books are not the word of God, but the words of man. God would never describe the woman that was created as a helpmate to man in these words. A woman is a sack full of excrement? Who is foolish enough to believe that religious books are inspired by God? And further to the sack of excrement, it goes on and on. Um, Talmud, a woman is unfit to be a judge. A daughter must not be taught the words of the Torah because the mind of a woman is not suited to be taught. And further to that, words of the Torah should be burned rather than being given to a woman. God knew about these words and approved these in the Torah. God warned that women should not touch the Torah, they say. And let's not forget that if a man and woman are drowning in a river, first, believe it or not, save the man. Lilith. In the 13th century, thanks to Eve, accusations by men that there was a perceived weakness of women and accusation of demonic possession was a go-to charge which increased significantly as the accused women were labeled demonic and only saintly men could cleanse them. Anyone out there know saintly men that's gonna cleanse women? Waiting for a saintly man to clean them is like putting dirty dishes in the sink and waiting for the food stuck on the plate to clean themselves. Adam, the biblical Adam from the garden. Early religious writers from most religions predicted there would be problems in the kingdom once woman set foot on the planet. Do you not know of their prayers to God that they did not need or want the creature called woman? Islam says men are above women because Allah has given the one part a superior superiority over the other. Confucianism, 100 girls are not worth one boy. Hinduism says a woman must never enjoy independence. Christianity, forget about it. Women shall be servants to men who are their lords and masters. This stranger, this is a mystical creature individual that can go back in time and look at the history of the war on women. Stranger, where is this written? And is this the word of God or man? Here's the deal. Somehow the gods have decided the word is being taken completely out of context and is being twisted and twitted all over the place and is attacking women from all angles against God's plan for man and woman, God's creation. That women are attacked for their looks, their bodies, their politics, their desires for equality, for education, for equal pay for equal work, justice in the courts, rights to their own bodies, safety from domestic violence in the home and abuse on the job and in the streets. Women must also fear some powerful men advocating and condoning, grabbing them by their life-giving chamber and kissing them against their wishes. This is just not locker room talk. This is a male call for action against women. If I were a woman, this subject would definitely qualify for some good old critical thinking on the war on women. It is often said that religion is made by and for men, and you might list the religions that agree about women. It is hard to explain that religions that agree on very little else unanimously agree that women are cursed or have less value than men. For example, here are quotes from various religions on some of their thoughts on women. 
but don't laugh when I mess up the pronunciation of some of these names. Maybe I should just spell them out and let others figure out the correct pronunciation. Hmm, not a bad idea. Let's start with Christianity. Leviticus 27, 3, 7 says, God defines the value of a woman as 60% of a man's value. Lilith, oh, now God is a mathematician. Stranger continuing. Hindu Master Mert Rita Trisha, 993. Males age 24 should marry females between the ages of 8 and 12. Islam, 424. Don't marry a woman that is already married unless they are slaves and you stole them in war. Lilith, let me see what Google says. Hmm. It said that it is alleged that Thomas Jefferson owned a slave woman of color, of color that he was intimate with. Was there a war going on? And if so, was he a believer in Islam? No wonder they don't want critical race theory taught in school. Stranger. There are other religions with strong anti-woman views also. Judaism, Talmud, Trachet Shabbat. A woman is a sack full of excrement. Eve. That statement is not worthy of a comment. Lilith, but also according to the Talmud section, Sanhedrin 881b to 82a, found on Google, here's a quote. All female Gentiles are regarded as menstrual filth, slaves, heathens, and whores. Furthermore, and for good measure, section Shabbat 152a states plainly that a woman is a sack full of excrement, brimming with nada, menstrual blood, with a bleeding hole. This is in your religious text. They unanimously agree. You women never should have hit the earth. Adam, Adam says in defense, but that was way back in the day, thousand years ago. I don't know if those sentiments still hold today. Lilla, little Adam, let me assure you that not only does the name calling of women still exist at the highest level of church and state, and did exist at the highest level of government before November 3rd, 2020, that current laws are being written to do more harm to women than ever before in the history of misogynism. Stranger, let me continue. In Buddhism, nuns have one third more rules to follow than monks in the Vanya Pataka. The failed man becomes a woman in the next life. Lilla, hmm, yeah, right. I see they not only had one third more duty, some nuns had taken priests to court for some of the extra duty that they had to perform in the back of the church. Wink, wink. I also see on Google, some men won't wait until the next life. They want the transformation now. Stranger, Zenism, dig and borrow. Women cannot achieve liberation without being reborn as a man. Pandora. Today, war still rages against women. Men today, as men in the past, continue to commandeer the word of God for purposes that God never intended. They profess to wear the cloth of religion, but many are wolves in sheep's clothing. But we've all been warned of false prophets. Have the people so easily forgotten the written warning, warnings in the biblical text of false prophets? Like, for example, in Matthew 24, 24 ESV, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead the flock astray, if possible, even the elect. Even the elect? Well, what about Jeremiah 23, 14? But in the prophets of the Jew, in Jerusalem, I have seen horrible things. They commit adultery and they walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of evildoers by selecting them for high office so that no one turns from his evil. Hmm, in high office, they select evildoers. Unbelievable. Oh, so much winning. Jeremiah goes on to say, all of them have become like Sodom to me, continues Jeremiah, and its inhabitants like Gomorrah. Look it up. In the book, The Clash of Civilizations, it said that after a war, the conflict would center on politics and culture, but they forgot about religion, race, critical thinking, and more wars, and the war on women. In the ancient Greek play, Lysistrata encourages women to stop having sex with men to end the bloody war. But Bette Midler, who is obviously a student of political sexual history, dug into the past to the year 411 BCE era and suggested the Strata plan could be revamped to impede the violation of women's rights and bodies in the 21st century. And like First Lady Nancy Reagan, Bette said, just say no, not to drugs, but no to sex. I suggest that all women refuse to have sex with men until they're guaranteed the right to choose by Congress, Bette Midler said, after the proposed tactic by the strata in the Greek place suggested that all women close their legs and all other orifices until the men stop the Peloponnesian War. 
In the play, the women asked the following question. Do we scare you men? Do we? The men then threatened to beat them and do a little rap and rhyme. Oh, hit them hard and hit them again and again until they run away. And perhaps they'll learn not to have too much to say. The women respond loudly. Come on then, do it, the woman cried. Come on then, do it. I won't budge, but like a dog, I'll bite at every little scrap of meat that dangles in my sight. The men call the women dirty sluts and think, say things like, women is the most shameless, shameless beast of all. The most shameless beast of all. Pandora, today war still rages against women. Men today, as men in the past, continue to commandeer the word of God for purposes that God never intended. They profess to wear the cloth of religion, but many are wolves in sheep's clothing, and they come in tailor-made suits also. But we all have been warned of false, false prophets. Have the people so easily forgotten the written warnings in the, in the Bible text on false prophets? Like, for example, in Man Matthew 24, 24 ESV, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead people astray. If possible, even the elect even the elect. But what about Jeremiah 20, 13, 23, 14? But in the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen things that remind me of Sodom and Gomorrah. So do you want to use critical thinking to be woke on the history of the war on women? Are you okay with the ban? That is a question for you young people to ask as you continue your personal journey in life. Stay safe. Thank you. Warren Woodbury. Thank you, Warren. It's better if my microphone's on. And our words for attendance are Holy Toledo. That's the attendance word, Holy Toledo. And I would like to welcome my friend from Arkansas, Donna. Donna Stevens is a historian. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're so glad to see you. This is just wonderful. Great this to see you. Thank you. I'm working from home today, so I'm, I'm happy to, to be able to take part in this. Thank you, Paulette. You are welcome. We've been friends for many years. She is a great woman and a wonderful historian. And so does anybody have any questions or comments for Warren? Well, I guess somebody that loves music. This is why I started we should have the music that we like. It's not just church music. Can't hear. So, it's, it's very, you're very creative. Warren has written a book, he's written a play, and now he's doing a podcast dealing with these issues of equity for women. And I think it's really interesting how the stories we tell make such a difference in the way people are treated along gender lines and along race lines. And part of the problem that we run into with the ban on critical thinking is this idea that we're not to discuss any of this storytelling. And if our students ask us any questions, we're not to answer. It's a really, a, a big incursion on academic yeah. freedom. Sadia, do you have something? Yeah, so I have a comment. Uh, Trinity commented, she said, I really loved the presentation and how he showed different religions all agreed on oppression of women, but not other things. Yeah, I think that's one of the things in Warren's work that is just amazing is he covers them all. He doesn't leave any of them out. And in, the, yes, Monchi. Yeah, when you finish, I was just raising my hands up to say, when you're done, I'll comment too. Oh, I'm done, you can. Oh, okay. Yes, I just want to thank um, Mr. Woodbury again. Every year, it's always a pleasure to see you and also to have you give your presentation. Um, my comment, is, it's more or less a question. How have young um, boys or young men that you mentor uh, responded to some of your work? Because I know you're a great mentor in the community 
And I wanted to find out whether comments from the young guys are different from those of young girls, because sometimes you'll be surprised that um, young women that you would expect them to be on board with what you're sharing uh, might feel otherwise. So can you just share your experience with um, your mentees? Well, unfortunately, I can't share my views in the school that I teach in. I teach mm -hmm. chess, but I do teach respect for each other. I make the boys respect the girls. I make the girls uh, respect yourself, and, and we teach that. This is our ninth year teaching in, in our school, okay? So wow. we teach chess, but we also, chess is life. We teach them how to win, how to lose, how to, to because it, it helps their education. It's a STEM-based, chess is STEM-based, and they have to think, they have to look into the future, but we have to stay away from being able to uh, address our personal views on religion, I can't go there. So we, I don't discuss that with the children. Uh, my, my outlook is an adult-based outlook and I'll get enough flack from, the, from the, uh, the church. I don't need to get it from the parents, you know? So, so I'm sort of ducking that bullet. So we don't, we don't incorporate my thoughts on religion and the treatment of women uh, in my presentation. No, but I Thank think you. You, you probably model for them healthy ways to interact. And that's mm -hmm. a good thing. So that's a very good thing. Well, do we have any more questions or comments? Shall I give some stuff away? One thing that's fun with Warren, too, is that he finds different ways to frame his message every year. It's timely and new and fresh because he looks at what's going on in the world and he updates and he makes changes so that we get a fresh speech. And if we're in a room, that room is rocking. So oh, we're in a room, that? he talks right to them and he just gets them going. And religion, that's really fun to watch. Religion and the abuse of women is a subject that keeps on giving. I've, <laughs> I've never run out of material. 